Uh, you're watching Notepad with me, Ibrahim Sani. Uh, this is uh, a show that uh, is going to be discussing both uh, business and tech mostly. But of course, tonight we shall deep dive into the world of pharmaceutical. A company that is uh, in focus right now is Duo Pharma Biotech because recently they have posted a year-on-year -year profit to 20 million ringgit, up 15.2% year-on-year for the first quarter and the 31st March this year. This is of course on improved revenue, bringing the company's earnings or EPS per share to 2 ringgit 19 cent from 1 ringgit 19 cent a year ago. For the first quarter of this year, the group's revenue rose 11.7% year-on-year to 185 million ringgit and its pre-tax profit rose 15% year-on-year to 26.65 million ringgit. This is of course boasted by higher sales to the consumer healthcare and private ethical sectors. The company said that they are cautiously optimistic about this year's outlook as the country's economies continue to reopen. So joining us in the studio right now is Lennon Arif Abdul Shata, the group MD of Duo Pharma Biotech, here to unpack all of this and above. Thank you very much, Leonard, for taking the time to speak with us. Let's do a quick review on the upcoming, I guess, second quarter uh, result, uh, uh, which is going to be announced in a few weeks' time, I suppose. Uh, I want to learn more about how the year has been progressing, how the first half of the year has been progressing, generally speaking. Okay, thanks, Ibrahim. Um, yes, the first quarter was actually a very strong quarter for Duo Pharma Biotech. Uh, in a way, it actually took us a little bit for, by surprise, given the fact that the economy was still nascently reopening. Yeah. Um, but having said that, there are challenges uh, that will hit the industry in totality over the course of this year, one of which being the uh, weakening of the ringgit vis-a-vis -vis the US dollar. Mm -hmm. um, and but, most currencies, actually. Uh, well, we seem to be dollar. tracking... Well, that's because the Singapore dollar basket is heavily US-weighted. But if okay. you look at it, how uh, we track against other currencies, Australian dollar, euro, etc., we we're not doing too bad. Yep. Um, but... Uh, Apart from that, demand we foresee as the economy continues reopening. Mm -hmm. And at some stage, I think we're going to see the return of some of the foreign medical tourism as well. Okay. So we, do, we are reasonably bullish that demand side will actually be positive mm -hmm. for 2022. Mm -hmm. I think the challenges are really... Uh, supply chain side and also exchange rate side. Okay, we've got to deep dive on the supply chain yeah. because every single CEO that sits where you sit right now asks, uh, talking about the supply chain issues, um, I'm a bit surprised that even pharmacy has uh, supply chain issues. Pardon me, because yeah. normally it's manufacturing or yeah. tech or whatever, right? But wh where, where is the hiccup lying right now? Okay. Uh, it comes, uh, I mean, it's become... Um, newsworthy recently about uh, shortages of pharmaceutical products and it's almost like the perfect storm okay let's look at it from two components one is domestic manufacturing and the other part is the imported with the imported products into the country the surge in demand in the first quarter caught everybody by surprise it was a lot stronger than they anticipated now you have to understand for a lot of the product that's imported into the country forecasts were probably done in quarter three last year mm. for quarter two this year. So quarter three last year, we were still smack in the middle of the MCO. Uh, we were just starting to slowly reopen. So majority of people doing forecasts for the Malaysian market, probably sitting in a de or at desk in quarter three, quarter four last year, may have under forecasted what the demand would be. Okay, so that's one contributor. We've almost got a perfect storm here. Mm. Then on the other hand, you have the local manufacturers. Different local manufacturers reacted towards the MCO in different ways. Mm -hmm. Some of them, like Duo Pharma, actually increased our raw material because we anticipated that there will be a bit of an issue. But some actually reduced because obviously uh, watching your working capital in during the MCO was key for survival. Mm -hmm. So, and obviously they would not have bought as much raw material as required. So, but that all these issues I think will be resolved. It's just time. Uh, the third issue, yes, there is one major manufacturer globally that has gone short due to various regulatory reasons that's created a shortage in the market. Now, this particular manufacturer controls about 70% of the market. Mm. So the balance 30% can't pick up the slack mm. as much as we would like to. Mm. Okay? Then the other part that's a quite interesting phenomena we're seeing at this point in time is uh, labour shortages. Foreign no. labour shortage? No, even uh, domestic labour shortages. I think we had a situation during the MCO where a lot of people had alternative, they needed a source of income. So they would uh, then go into, let's say, the gig economy, the grab, drivers, etc. Yeah, but during this period, a lot of foreign workers were actually sent back to countries of origin. So now it's reopening, but the 
passageway for foreign workers to come back into the country is not reached up to um, a level that's optimal. Mm -hmm. So as a result, there's a lot of jobs available for locals and therefore, you know, you get this common complaint about why is it there's less grab drivers, why is it there's less motorcycle drivers, etc. It's because they've taken up roles that have become available since the MCO because of lack of foreign workers. Now, this is affecting, I think, the entire economy at the moment. So, you know, it, it's, how, it's... How do you manage these kind of different, I guess, uh, challenges? Because one is about labour, another <laughs> one, you know, the, the yeah. market demand, it's, another one... It's a perfect storm, isn't it? Yeah. Um, now, we have to ad address each one individually. Obviously, things like the exchange rate, there's not much we can do about it. Yeah. Uh, obviously, it makes our exports more attractive. Mm -hmm. So that gives us a natural hedge against the currency. That's right. Uh, so, obviously, for that, we want to push exports as much as possible. Mm. When you talk about la local labour shortages, um, we were very quick to adopt the government policy of the revised minimum wage, um, but we noticed it hasn't made too much of a difference. Mm -hmm. One of the issues I think we face as an industry, in the pharmaceuticals at least, is a lot of our manufacturing facilities are subscale because we're building facilities to cater for a 32 million population. Oh, okay. So how do you compare against a facility that's say in China or in India or in Indonesia yeah. that caters for a much larger population? So obviously they're more, um, they're more international scaled. Um, so, you know, a lot of people say, why don't you just automate to reduce your reliance on workers? Mm -hmm. uh, not so easy because to automate, you need scale. Mm -hmm. So as a result, we're very good at making small batches, um, but when we have to make large batches, that's the only opportunity we can. But it's a slow burn. It doesn't take. It's not something you can convert overnight. So we've been looking at automation over the course of the last uh, seven to eight years. Mm -hmm. uh, but again, the biggest hurdle for us is the scale of our production. Okay, uh, makes it difficult. The, I, I, the, the issue is, of course, also capital injection. Um, Capex uh, per se uh, to just improve on the production capacity. Yeah. Um, we're looking at some of your uh, past quarter, maybe eight or nine quarters. You, you've actually quite been rather balanced um, with uh, with a net profit averaging about 13 or have, having a range of 13 to 17 or yeah. 20 million ringgit um, um, up to last quarter. Revenue is about 133 to 181. Uh, 171, pardon me, uh, million ringgit. That's kind of stable. You even posted a 1.8 cent yeah. dividend last quarter. This, all this proves that um, you have a rather stable business. Wouldn't this be a good time to back borrow or steal capital to boost that kind of scale that you're looking at right now? Yeah. Maybe the, not, the maybe two not parts. steal. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> back and borrow. There's, there's two parts about it because um, on the one hand, you're right. In fact, Duo Pharma has actually spent 300 million in the course of the last six years in capital expenditure. We're building a new factory in Klang. We've invested in a new oncology facility in Glenmarie. Uh, we recently spent an uh, uh, amount of capex to rejig our production facility in Bangi, mm -hmm. all with the intention of um, eventually getting all our sites accredited beyond just Malaysian GMP. Our ultimate target is to actually have EU certification for all our facilities, but mm -hmm. we're doing it in stages. So we'll start with the oncology facility in Glenmarie Marie, that will probably get you certification before uh, before first half of next year. Mm -hmm. And then the next stage will be Bangi and then eventually Klang, where we're building our new facility. Now, we need the certification in order to be able to increase the proportion of exports that we do. At the moment, our exports are only between 7 to 9% oh, of I didn't our know total that. revenue. Yes. Oh, okay. It's actually quite small. So, Which gives you a lot of room or ample room to grow. Yes, it does. It does. Uh, but this is where scale becomes key because you need to be competitive, re competitive regionally as opposed to just competitively domestically. Mm. So um, we need the certifications because this is a very heavily regulated industry, mm -hmm. and you are competing against countries that see the pharmaceutical or at least self-sufficiency in pharmaceuticals as uh, a strategic move. Mm -hmm. So those countries do not make it easy to access um, the pharmaceutical trade there. Mm. So we need to do it in stages, get your assets right, get your certification right, and then get your product mix right. Mm. So that's the other thing. In parallel to getting spending this 300 million in capital, we've also been doing a lot of effort in the biological side, mainly because there's less competition regionally. Mm -hmm. And we think we have a broad idea. We've been working on this since 2012. We think uh, we have a broad idea about how to access the, the regional market, but doing products that are maybe not uh, available 
in those domestic markets. Yeah. What markets are we talking about? We're talking about countries like Indonesia, Thailand, Philippines. These are uh, countries... Are they are, market restrictive or prohibitive for folks like you to come in? It's, it's not easy to get in. Uh, it is possible, but um, it's, it's sometimes some of the non-trade barriers that we have difficulty with. And in some cases... Do explain. What do you mean non-trade well, barriers? Well, it's, like it's an example. Uh, no, 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 it's not political. I think it's how the regulatory framework has evolved in those countries. I'll give you a classic example. In Malaysia, you think nothing about walking into a pharmacy and get the, and uh, buying a 1,000 mg vitamin C when you're not feeling yeah, well. Yeah. Perfectly okay. Yeah. In Philippines, anything above 100 mg requires a doctor's prescription. Oh, these nitty-gritty things. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So you're going down to the brass tax. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So this is where different countries have evolved. I mean, I'm sure the Philippines has their own reason for having done so. Of course. Yeah, so, um, but then a product that you would commercialize in Malaysia, which may be very popular, we can't commercialize in the Philippines because um, of the nature of the fact that that product now requires a prescription. Yeah, so this is what I mean about some countries are slightly different in terms mm. of the regulatory framework. So in a way, to get the lowest common denominator equates to the largest market. So you need to design your products to be able to, right from the way, uh, get go, design it to cater for the entire region. Okay. And in some cases, it might be dumbing down the product a little bit. Oh, yeah. uh, well, one short break. When we come back, we'll discuss a little bit more with Duo Pharma um, and uh, particularly how they are going to break, in, break through some of the international markets that they have right now. Welcome back. In the studio joining me is, of course, uh, Leonard Arif Mohamed Abdul Shata, pardon me, uh, the Group MD of uh, Duo Pharma Biotech. Before we went to the break, we are talking about some of the international market possibilities that you're entering. Um, I still want to deep dive on that area as well because um, when you post something like 170 million ringgit revenue and, you know, mostly it comes from domestic affairs, um, items like uh, uh, Duo Pharma bagging a 375 million ringgit contract to supply um, biosimilar insulins to the Malaysian Health Ministry and so on. I you must have that kind of split view because uh, you need to entrench yourself domestically because that's really where the core market is. You're bagging close to 200 ringgit revenue every year domestically. But at the same time, this cannot be sustainable, I suppose, yeah. or growth strategy must include international markets. How do you split your view in terms of the importance of each of that component, domestic and international? Yeah, thanks. Um, the way we are split at the moment, very broadly, is about 10% international and 90% domestic, which is split approximately 50-50 between private sector and also government sector. Mm. So you're right, the domestic market still becomes a key driver for Duo Pharma's profitability. Mm. Having said that, however, as we move forward, um, one of the issues with the pharmaceutical industry, uh, the reality is the fact that um, mm. there's no raw materials that are manufactured domestically. So it's heavily import dependent for all uh, majority of its raw materials. Which means API. your cost goes up quite considerably exactly, when under it comes to current circumstances. That's right. So, um, and some of these tenders we enter into is for two years, three years. So um, factoring it becomes a little bit awkward, etc. Yeah. So having an export component to, in a way, rebalance or give us a natural hedge mm -hmm. on our currency exposure for the raw materials is very, very key. So you're right. We need to place a lot of focus on the international market. And ideally, uh, internally within Duo Pharma, we have this um, mantra where we say a third, a third, a third. You know, let it be a third international, a third private local, and a third government local. Mm -hmm. uh, we think that would give us the right balance because obviously we're a Malaysian company and our focus will always be in Malaysia. But we do believe that we are able to eventually launch products that will have a more regional appeal to it. Mm -hmm. And we're doing it in our consumer healthcare site to begin with. Mm -hmm. um, uh, back uh, in the early 2000s, we bought over a brand called Flavets and we've relaunched it in Malaysia and it's doing very, very well. And we have aspirations for that brand to be a regional brand mm -hmm. as we move forward as well. Because it's in consumer healthcare, it's slightly easier from a regulatory framework. 
mm -hmm. rather than if it were an ethical uh, product. Mm -hmm. But on the ethical front, which means when we say ethical, we're talking about products that require prescription. Mm -hmm. um, we're looking at biologicals to be the way forward mm -hmm. because um, the, the, the competitive intensity in that area is a lot lesser, both domestically but also regionally as we're well. We're talking about something like insulin, for instance. Insulin, um, erythropoietin, yes. and there's quite a number. We're looking at the, one of the other products we're working on is a factor eight. Um, this is for, it's a, it's a blood byproduct, but you can make it synthetically. We're looking at the synthetic oh. factor eight. Mm -hmm. So we are looking at the biological front and looking at how we add value because we're already doing fill and finish in Malaysia on the biologicals. Yeah. But I think um, we think there's a space that we can actually develop the product domestically. One of the reasons why we chose the biological uh, is because unlike the other products that we're manufacturing, where it requires a large amount of importation, the biologicals basically you grow the the bugs mm. internally. So mm. your raw material is localized mm. as opposed to having to import it and therefore be exposed to that US dollar exposure. Okay. The, as an investor, as a personal private investor, I only look at three areas, consumer electronics, consumer technology, and consumer healthcare. Yeah. However, of the three, I'm only familiar with those two, the first okay. two that we're talking about. It's every day that we talk about this, nearly every day at least. Um, one area that I'm looking at is try, trying to learn more about the consumer healthcare. And in this case, your business is definitely that. Why consumer healthcare and not just healthcare is because I feel that the consumer businesses have the ability to scale. They are, you know, Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies mostly, predominantly are consumer companies. There is a lot of room to grow here. Where would it be? Where would it lie in terms of your business, in terms of trying to grow this, but trying to make people like me understand your work? I understand that timeline is going to be a little bit longer. You know, when you think about building an iPhone, it's a, like, I don't know, five to ten year kind of horizon. Where does it lie when it comes to healthcare, um, uh, particularly pharmaceuticals? Try to make me, uh, you know, uh, uh, understand a little bit more about the life cycle of a product, um, how it works in terms of R and D, the kind of money that needs to be involved um, in terms of developing new medicine, or fill and finish, or any other um, repurposing of the products, uh, or rebranding and, and, and slapping on your label onto the market. Where is the gap in terms of market understanding with what you do? Okay, well, let's look at potential to begin with. Um, consumer, when we talk about consumer healthcare, you're very much talking about the products that you're available to be purchased from a pharmacy or a supermarket, what we call front end products. It doesn't require prescription. So it's really, really, really a B2C type marketing. Mm. And therein lies the biggest cost when it comes to consumer marketing, uh, mm. consumer healthcare. It's actually the AMP cost in order to support a brand. But if you're looking at potential, if you look at the per capita consumption of consumer healthcare products, I call it OTC, over the counter mm. products. Um, and you compare it against countries like Taiwan, Singapore, Australia. Malaysian per capita consumption of consumer healthcare products is only about one third to 40% of per capita compared to these countries. So in terms of potential, it's huge. Um, the second part is how do you access this market and the life cycle? Now, the life cycle is very much like most consumer products. It requires a high level of innovation because consumers get bored after a while, unless mm -hmm. you can develop a household product that has a longevity. But generally speaking, you're talking about any product only having a longevity of five to 10 years. Development cost is actually quite low for consumer healthcare products. It's relatively easy to develop a product and it's relatively easy to register the product. The issue will come in terms of establishing the market and establishing what I call the handle that gets people wanting to buy the product. So we're putting a lot of money um, internally within Duo Pharma to support brands like Champs, which is the largest uh, children's vitamin C, Flavets, which is the largest adult vitamin C at mm. the moment. Mm -hmm. um, we were relatively lucky in the sense that we were already the largest vitamin C producer in Malaysia prior to the MCO. Now, mm -hmm. obviously, when the pandemic came about, uh, everybody was looking at immunity boosting products, etc. Mm -hmm. So that helped the Duo Pharma bottom line to get some of the results you were talking about just now. But having said that, yes, I also agree that uh, consumer healthcare will be a fantastic area as we move forward. As Malaysia develops, as Malaysia ages, then the consumption in the uh, consumer healthcare s uh, space will actually go up. Okay. Uh, we'll go for one more short break. When we come back, we'll discuss a little bit more with Duo Pharma.
Welcome back. I have with me in the studio uh, Dual Pharma's uh, Group MD, uh, Leonard. Let's talk about the halal aspect of uh, pharmaceuticals as well as the ESG component. Um, both are actually not just driving the pharmaceutical sector, but of course many other sectors um, that we have right now, including energy. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit more about halal. Mm -hmm. Well, halal was something that we were we actually moved the fastest. This goes back back in the actually the last century, um, where last we, century, <laughs> last okay. century, it sounds okay. like a long time yeah. ago. We were I was thinking quarter, but yeah, no, no, last century. What what happened at that time was we were going to invest in a, the first soft gel facility in Malaysia, and we wanted to have an angle into the soft gel manufacturing. And at that time, most of the gelatin that was available was porcine-related gelatin. So we made a fundamental stance at that stage to say, no, we were going to actually develop a soft gel product with uh, bovine gelatin, mm. and gelatin from a cow. Mm. So that began the journey. And then we went on from there to get a certification. At that time, it was halal for food only. Eventually, the government introduced uh, halal certification for pharmaceuticals and today more than 90 percent uh, 95 percent of the products are actually halal certified mm -hmm. the five percent that's not is basically going through the renewal process mm -hmm. so uh, we're quite proud of uh, how, how far we've come in the halal journey but i think from our perspective we've always seen um, pushing for halal certification as part of the sustainability journey as well for, for the company. Because we, we want to eventually reach a point where our products are available and are able to be consumed by everybody. Mm -hmm. So just going bovine soft gel is not where we want to end. Mm -hmm. Eventually, we want to be able to remove any animal uh, source product from mm -hmm. the final product as well to give us maximum accessibility uh, throughout uh, throughout the country as well. We're talking about the production aspect, but what about the demand side? Do people actually want this thing? They are, they are. Uh, the, the demand is there. Is it sizable? Um, it's very hard to say that because 100% um, of our products, especially consumer healthcare, is actually halal. Mm. So every demand, every every tube that gets sold is actually a halal product. Mm. So it's hard to say, is it being sold because it's halal or is it because of its features or because of its branding? Mm. Um, I, get faced, I get asked this question many, mm. many times. Uh, the way I usually answer is, I think if our products were not halal certified, then I think we would not be as high in terms of sales as we are today. Okay. So there is a component. Like an implicit the component. Consumer, an implicit component on uh, that's driving our overall demand. Okay, let's talk about ESG then. Yeah. Because uh, where does ESG play in terms of the pharmaceutical business? Do you feel that um, some of the attacks that people normally levy against, say, Big Pharma, for instance, needs to be addressed quite conservatively because there's so many things uh, that needs to be addressed first? Yes, I mean the the, uh, the ESG part actually has you know the three components you know the environmental, mm. the social, and the governance. Mm. Um, we've actually uh, one of the component stocks under the FTSE for Good in Malaysia, mm -hmm. uh, and we've ha been we've had it for the last two years, mm -hmm. and we're in the process of an audit at the moment. Mm -hmm. uh, where and they are very very detailed, I mm -hmm. must say. I mean this latest audit is incredible. <laughs> really? But having said that, I think what are the chances you think you're going to be retained? I th I hope so. I hope so because okay. we put equal amount of effort on an annual basis. Um, mm. The number of questions have gone up by about forty percent this year. Number of the questions. Number of questions. Okay. Um, but I think. You know, you, it's it's not. Uh, there's a lot of rhetoric about the ESG, but I think uh, at its very core is um, realization, and this cuts across the organization that we have to leave this planet in a better position than when we came in. Yeah, that's that's the underlying, and how you do it would differ from company to company. We've decided we'll go. Um, you know, uh, carbon neutral by 2030 and zero carbon by 2050. Hopefully, we'll be able to achieve the targets earlier um, because there's a lot of debate because I think there's no clear path on ESG. So some people would argue that uh, renewable energy certificates, RECs, RECs, mm. Uh, should not be utilized mm. to as, as an excuse for the carbon that you're generating. That's right. So, you know, so what we're That's an argument, but I, I yeah. don't agree to that. Well, but. Yeah, and then of yeah. course, can you buy a rec from overseas for carbon that you're you should because in uh, as an accountant, everything should equal. Exactly, that's so, my opinion. But I'm not running a business. I'm just yeah. here asking questions. So this is, this is a challenge for us because um, it's there's there's a lot of differing interpretations on what it means to 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 um, actually achieve. So what we have done, we've been a member of the UNGC, the Global Compact 
we were signatory early on. We've been working with uh, their constituent companies here in Malaysia to assist us because I don't think we can do it by ourselves. But we think that's something that's important enough for us to have made a pu public commitment, first and foremost. Secondly, uh, an investment in it as well. Um, we're still evaluating solar because that's an interesting one because when we look at our investment in solar um, in terms of carbon pr footprint, doesn't actually remove as much as we thought it would. Mm. So, <laughs> so, so it's kind of flashy. You have it in your annual yeah, report. Yeah, it's, it's visible. It's visible. Yeah. So, so, but what we've started doing is we're starting to install EV charges at our factories. Now that might move the needle. I suppose. Yeah, I, I think it's it's a chicken and egg situation. You need to. I'm not going to see any of my staff um, buying electric cars unless they know they can get it charged yeah. in a, in a, in a in I'm a one of them. We have two EV chargers here yeah. at the campus. Yeah, so we've started putting EV chargers. We've started two in one of our facilities, and eventually every facility will have it. And what we're hoping, because um, obviously while we have our own aspirations for ESG for the country, we're hoping that Malaysia as well is able to achieve its own environmental targets as we move forward. So I would love to eventually invest in an electric car, but I'm hoping the infrastructure is there. Firstly, to allow me to charge yeah. it in an apartment. Secondly, to be able to charge it on the highway. Very quickly, Leonard, we don't have much time left. Is this a, the best time to be uh, in the pharmaceutical business? Um, I don't think there's a good and bad time. <laughs> I think it's an industry that is a necessity, is strategic for the country. Mm. And I think that uh, the the pandemic has opened up an interesting discussion on how much self-sufficiency do you want to to achieve very high rather than That's the answer. have to rely on importation and That's in, the in that sense the pandemic I think the pharmaceutical that. industry is key for the country absolutely thank you very much I wish I can have you a lot more no uh, on the show but for now that was Leonard Arif Abdul Shatta the group MD of Duo Pharma Biotech Berhad you can catch all of these kind of interviews on our social sites as well as on astronomy.com the last time Leonard we spoke was about four or five years ago pre-pandemic and things were a lot different then it's unbelievable how things have changed over the past few years uh, but thank you very much for coming over. Catch you uh, in the next one.